Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Professor James Lawrenson. I'm the director of the Australia-China Relations Institute at the University of Technology, Sydney. UTS ACRI was established by UTS in 2014. It was then, still is today, Australia's only research institute solely about informing Australia's engagement with China. A lot gets said about China in Australia and a fair bit gets said about Australia in China. Not all of it is well informed, but it's, a, I think, a, a mark of UTS's dedication to the Australia-China relationship that it sees fit to support a research institute like ACRI. It's my pleasure to be with you all today for today's webinar. Um, I'm sitting here in Sydney on Broadway at UTS campus, and I'm conscious that as I sit here, I'm sitting on the ancestral lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nations, of the Eora Nation. So on behalf of all those present, uh, I would like to acknowledge the, their elders, past, present and emerging, and emerging recognising them as the traditional owners of knowledge, custodians of knowledge on the lands on which I sit. Well, welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. A very brief bit of housekeeping as we begin. First up, this webinar today is being recorded. Next, be aware that you'll have an, an opportunity to ask plenty of questions and answers. The format for today is a roughly a 30 minute discussion between myself and our three panelists, uh, which should allow 20 minutes for questions and answers with the audience. Please do feel free to, to uh, lodge those questions in the Q&A section of the control panel at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And thank you for those people who've already submitted questions to today's webinar. Um, I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to get to many of those. Now, let's introduce the panel. One of the truly fabulous things about working at a quality institution like UTS is the talent that we see on our campus every day and the success that many of our graduates go on to achieve in their careers. And that's certainly true for our three panelists today. Let me start by introducing Yi Ying Lu. Yi Ying Lu is an award-winning artist, entrepreneur, educator, and bilingual speaker. Now, even if you haven't heard of Yi Ying's name directly, I'm sure you've come across her work. I know I have Yi Ying. From the Twitter whale to dumpling emoji, Disney Shanghai Mickey Mouse to Conan O'Brien pale whale, Ian Liu creates iconic designs and brands. Those ones I've just been through certainly demonstrate that. Ian's works, work transcends linguistic barriers. It really unites people around the world and enchants audiences from all nations. Welcome, Ian. Thank you, James. Hello, everybody. Aside from being an entrepreneur, Ian is also a sought after speaker bilingual English and Chinese. Um, she's spoken at events such as the South by Southwest conference and one we're all familiar with in Australia, TEDx as well. It's a real delight to have you with us today, Yi Ying. Thank you, I'm grateful to be here. Next up, we have Alex Sierre. Alex, welcome. Alex began his career in Sydney at KPMG as he's since gone on to be the in-house tax leader of numerous multinational companies. Currently, Alex leads the in-house tax advisory department of an international multinational company. It is also an active member of Alineal Global. That's an international accounting network with more than 160 members across the world. As if that's not enough, Alex, your CV is impressive because as well as that, you're also the director of a private equity firm, which specializes in investing in pre-IPOs. You're the director of an engineering firm that specializes in underground car parking solutions and the co-founder of Founder CFO, uh, who specializes in financial solutions for tech startup companies. Alex, I don't know when you get to sleep, but I'm glad you're here with us today. Thanks for joining us. And finally, P 
Peggy Wong. Welcome, Peggy. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Jane. Yeah. Now, Peggy is the Director of Internet Integrated Marketing Communications at a leading high-end jeweler based in beautiful Beijing. Many of you will know it. It's called I Do. I guess, Peggy, you sell a lot of product to people getting married with a name yeah. like, with a company name like that. Now, Peggy is highly skilled in integrated marketing communication strategy, obviously, uh, but like our other panelists, that's not all Peggy is highly skilled at. Um, she's also skilled at brand, brand communication, content generation, media management. In fact, Peggy, there's not a lot that you don't do. Is that correct? Yes, almost everything. <laughs> I, I only wish my skill set was as diverse as yours, Peggy, but unfortunately it's not. So the best I can do today is to interview our three talented panelists. Well, thank you for to joining us, for joining us, um, each, all three of you. Let's get started. Look, I want to start off this webinar with a question that I think is the key one. This is the question that if our audience takes away an answer to today, then I'll be happy with it. And it's this question here. What are the essential skills to professional success? Now, the three of you today, you sit here as successful business people, but it wasn't so long ago that you were sitting on the UTS campus, like I am now at Broadway in Sydney. What are the key skills that have delivered your professional success? Yi-Ying, I might go to you first, and then we'll go to Alex and Peggy. Um, let's keep our answers nice and concise, but let's leave the audience with some key takeaways to this question. Uh, Yi-Ying, why don't you start us off? Absolutely. Thanks, James. That's a great question. Um, I'd say it's, it's a very good question. That's why I have actually two words. One is um, curiosity. Um, the world is, is such a vast entity and we all are coming from different backgrounds. Um, I think when you enter any market, when you enter any new place with a sense of wonder and curiosity is gonna lead you um, to some sort of unknown but exciting places that you would never imagine. And the other thing I think is also very important is empathy, is the innate understanding and standing into somebody else's position and consider. And so I think these are the two very key thing. They're intertwining because you will have empathy if you're curious about other people. And once you become a curious person, you will try to have that feeling of how it is like to be in the other person's shoe. Ying, I can already see your artistic talent shining through in that answer. So let's just recap that. Ying's given us two key skills, curiosity and empathy. Alex, let's go to you next. If I asked you, you're successful now, wasn't that long ago you were at UTS, what are the key skills for you that have delivered professional success? Thanks, James. Uh... I couldn't agree anymore, uh, you know, uh, with eating on the, uh, the curiosity part. Uh, I guess in my, uh, in my instance, I've believed among others, uh, soft skills or people skills, if you like, uh, would be essential uh, in any profession. Now, uh, just to give you a bit of my, I guess, my own experience, I still clearly recall that that was during one of my interviews uh, with one of the big four firms, uh, back in Sydney in the early 2000s. The, uh, the senior manager that interviewed me shared with me that uh, to succeed in our profession, we really need to have, uh, I guess, a good balance of the technical and soft skills, uh, let's say 50-50. Now, 15 years into my profession, I've had a good taste of the importance of soft skills, I guess, uh, in, in a successful profession. Uh, as a matter of fact, in a China's environment, I've come, I've come to learn that uh, soft skills could sometimes uh, weigh more than technical skills in, in many real life scenarios. So I guess uh, keep working on the soft skills. Thank you, James. 
Thanks, Alex. You know, it's interesting because you're a, a tax leader. And I think when we think about tax leaders, we often imagine the technical skills that you no doubt have. So I think it's very important for our audience today that here we've got someone clearly who has the technical skills. But right now, what you're telling us is one of the perhaps the key skill to your success has in fact been the soft skills that you've learned to, and bring to your profession. That's an important takeaway. So we've got soft skills, we've got curiosity, and we've got empathy. I'm pretty happy how we're going. Okay, Peggy, it's your turn. Um, you're now the marketing head of a major high-end jewelry producer in Beijing. You're successful. What skills can you identify as having led to your success? I think the most important skill would be um, exactly the type of professional knowledge that you get through the UDS communication management master degree education. I see that 80% of professional knowledge that I now use every day came from my UDS education. So you can see this degree can give you a great head start and benefit your entire career. Second communication skill, uh, which I learned at UDS, I love this major. I believe this is not only a major, a career, but also a life philosophy. No matter in life or work, you should pay more attention to communication. This major teaches us how to think in each other's perspectives, not only in your own way. It also teaches us how to better communicate, how to, how to bring win-win solutions. Uh, so that, um, those two, and also keep learning and trying new things to make you grow. Thanks, Peggy. So I, from your answer, I can see some alignment with what Alex is talking about in terms of those soft skills and you nominate communication skills as being important to your success. But you also do make the important point that while it's, you know, let's emphasize that, but those professional skills that you learned, you mentioned back in your days at UTS, um, they continue to serve you well as well. Look, thanks very much. I think that's, there's some key points. And if our audience, if that's all they remember from our discussion today, I think we'll have left our audience with some important takeaways. Quick follow on, and Peggy, you kind of have done this already, but I'd like to go around the group again. Now that we've talked about those key skills, um, Yi Ying, you mentioned curiosity and empathy. Can we connect those to your UTS experience? I mean, were there, are, there, are there standout memories you have of where your curiosity, for example, or perhaps your empathy was peaked um, during your time of study at UTS? Um, I'd be keen, keen to connect your study with those skills that you now identify as being so important. Ian, we'll go to you first. Okay, thanks, James. Uh, again, I think I absolutely enjoyed, studied, in UTS and also study in Australia. Um, I went straight out of Shanghai when I finished my high school, um, came to Australia. And what I found the really kind of the essence and the, um, the beauty of in the city, in the country is the diversity um, of people and the diversity of culture that I was able to experience firsthand as an international student on campus. I remember we have International Culture Day. I remember we have like night market in Chinatown and afternoon market. The students put it up with like students from Cuba, students from Colombia, students from Africa. And we have international um, canteens that serves food from around the world. I think this is how I get the inspiration of designing like the dumpling emoji, the chopstick, the fortune cookie, and the takeout box. In a way, I think it is the, the curiosity is in everyday life because everything is so new and different. There's familiarity. When you go to UTS, Chinatown is around the corner, even though I was born and raised in China. But Chinatown to me, it's through the lens of Australia and it's the Australian interpretation of the Chinese culture. And that's really interesting. It's new, but it's also familiar. It's that intertwining of culture and also this infused people. I think what Alex mentioned and Peggy mentioned, which is people and communication, are the very core of the reason why study overseas as an international student, that's a invaluable experience. Um, I remember Jack Ma said this sentence and I love it. 
he actually told his um, his key person, he said, whether you're doing B2B or B2C, it's always P2P. B2B as in business to business, B2C is business to consumer. It's always P2P because it's always people to people. Whichever business or organization is always run by people. And I think that being able to be in a position that you're able to experiencing different kinds of people interdisciplinary area. And I think that's also part of the reason why I love UTS because it's a, it's, a, it's a university and all these buildings, you know, we can talk to folks from the IT building, we can talk to folks at engineering building. And it's always so interesting. And I took the interdisciplinary course. Um, and to this day, I still kept in touch with Dr. Louise McQuinney, who is now the Dean of um, Innovation and Interdisciplinary. Um, she, at the time, was my professor at DAB um, in Viscom. And so these relationships that I have still kept after I graduated for more than 10 years, it's that, it's that valuable. And I think that is, that's the key sort of takeaway uh, from my time in, in UTS. Thanks, Ying. So that's interesting because you identify those skills of curiosity and empathy to start off with, but these weren't things that you just naturally started out with or that fell into your lap. Um, they were skills that were developed over time. And um, you mentioned that the diversity of the experience you had at UTS was part of that part of that the, the process that that enriched those skills for you alex let's go to you next um when you before you mentioned those soft skills well reflecting back at your time at uts were there examples or times you remember when those soft skills were enhanced through that study experience absolutely absolutely i guess one of the best examples is as Ying Ying, I guess, already uh, mentioned, is that such there's a such a great, I guess, uh, diverse community within the, the UTS campus. I've met uh, many great great friends there, and uh, until today, uh, I guess I'm still uh, good friends with many of them. And when I whenever I go back to Sydney, I go and visit them. And some of those guys they've come to China and pay me a visit as well. Uh, and I guess that was throughout the four year period at UTS. I I've had the opportunity to uh, to have established this relationship with many great people, uh, and also I guess uh, within the uh, the UTS community, there was so much support from from the UTS I guess staff. There's a lot of different facilities that's available to both local and international students, and uh, one of the best I guess uh, memories for myself uh, will be that uh, I've. Uh, I've taken the opportunity to actually go to the uh, the career services center that was, I think, within the main building on Broadway. That actually did help me quite a bit in terms of uh, landing me a full-time job with one of the big four firms in Sydney. So uh, I guess, you know, for those of, those of you, you know, on the uh, webinar today who's about to graduate and to, to start a full-time profession, I would strongly recommend you to, uh, to explore get to explore the facilities and, and the services available to, you know, to yourself. And I think you will definitely benefit a lot from those. Back to you, James. Thanks, Alex. So see, we're, we're expanding our list here again. Um, Alex has given us support uh, before he mentioned the diversity. So it's a diverse environment at UTS, but even better than that, the support here to help you take advantage of that diversity. Peggy, let's go to you now. Now, you, the skills you identified were professional skills and communication skills. Um, reflecting back at your time at UTS, were there specific times or instances that stood out to you when those professional skills and communication skills got a real boost? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Alex and Ian. Um, you guys talk about making me miss uh, UTS life. Even though I still miss the UTS house building, the public area, the outdoor roof, the audiovisual rooms. My friend and I always have wonderful time around campus. The physical space at UDS always facilitated um, our social life. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about uh, communication management master degree uh, further, uh, what I learned from the master degree. 
I always tell people that I really appreciate the professional education I received at UDS. It gave me almost everything, every, uh, everything I need in my daily work. Uh, all the courses are very practical, great preparation for work. For example, um, in the corporate communication course, I learned negotiation skills. Yes, including how to negotiate with different partners. The professor gave us a lot of time to, um, you know, a workshop, a work, workshop time to practice the negoti negotiation skills. I use those skills every day when I negotiate with the third parties now, the celebrities, and even my friends and the coworkers. The course taught me negotiation skills and had me sign a lot, a lot of important contracts, chunk contracts through these years. Um, my favorite course was on social media accounts, and it's Professor Jean was my favorite favorite professor. Professor Jim taught me um, that to always think in the way of integrate, uh, integrated communication. I still in on uh, 2011 when he said in class, integrated communication is future. In the next few years, PR, advertising, and social media, we all come together. Now his, word, his words have come true. I always keep in my mind what he said in class, and now I'm a, I am an integrated communication practitioner. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Back to uh, back to James, thank you. Thanks, Peggy. After listening to you, the next time I meet you in Beijing, I will make sure I don't get into a negotiation process with you because I'm pretty sure I'll come off second best. Okay. All right. Don't worry, don't worry. I'll I talk with you, yeah. Yeah, you take, t take care of me, uh, Peggy, as, as your UTS colleague. All right, folks, let's move on from those preliminary questions now. I'm conscious that our audience today are living in a, a society, an economy, a job market, where there are waves of change that are crashing over them. Um, there's big areas of upheaval. So, you folks today have successfully negotiated those waves of change. So I thought I might pinpoint a few of them uh, and invite you to comment on how you've successfully navigated those challenges. Because frankly, it can be a bit daunting, particularly in 2020, um, a, a time of really unrivaled change. Let's, um, let's I might start with you. Digital technology, I mean, this is everywhere nowadays. And, you know, it's exciting because digital technology is one of the world's fastest growing markets, but it's also got an uncomfortable side in that, you know, for example, it affects how we consume information or sometimes misinformation or disinformation. So as an artpreneur, and an Adobe Creative Ambassador, I mean, what are the key changes you've seen in the media space, that digital media communication space that you think our audience today need to be aware of in their careers? Sure, uh, that's a great question, James. Thank you for that. Um, I'm not sure if how many of the students are communication students. If you are communication students, I'm sure you're familiar with um, uh, Marshall McLuhan, who's an amazing uh, communication uh, godfather, who said, um, the medium is the message. And the medium of communication changes every day because of the technology advancement. As we know that back in the days, we were using newspapers and we watch a lot of ads on TV. There's a lot of um, advertising agencies giving out direct marketing items through your mailbox. But nowadays, we are using WeChat, TikTok, um, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and Snapchat. And so the idea of architecture of information is moving from physical realm into the digital realm. It is inevitable. However, I think the, the essence of who we, who we are as human, um, however the advance, advancement of technology is, like we will have AR and VR, it's already happening. A lot of jobs are being replaced, but what we needed to really kind of think about, especially during this ever-changing time, uh, this year is very challenging to a lot of people. The coronavirus come. Uh, as you know, I'm a public speaker and I've been speaking around the world in the last five years. 
and I couldn't be physically in space doing workshops or giving speech to thousands of people in person anymore. So what you needed to do is quickly sort of looking at what you can do to pivot. This is what startup companies says all the time, how are we gonna pivot? And the idea of pivoting is not forgetting the essence of the message. The medium will change. No matter you want it or not, it, it is going to change. And that's not something that you can control. But what you, you, you cannot control is how the situation will be. But what, what is within your control is how you respond towards it. So being able to really kind of be agile and be adaptable and be curious, what can I do? Um, how can I pivot? I give you a really simple example. When I was an international student, as you are all here, you're all international students, we're paying a lot more than local students, as we all know. And we are allowed to give us, um, the, the government is giving us 20 hours to, to work. And that to me, I think it, it's the biggest gift because of the financial pressure. And I didn't want it to re rely on my parents saving. I started to work in my first year because we didn't have any design experience. We cannot take any design job. So in my first year, I took all kinds of different jobs from being a waitress in, in you know, Chinatown or you know, being a bilingual interviewer and serving people sushi and um, teaching kids how to draw during the weekend. And I did all kinds of different jobs. This is how I started to learn communication, even though I wasn't like Peggy, I took a communication master degree. But that to me is so valuable. Um, it's a complementary skill that I took at DAB as design skill. And in the meantime, I started in second year. I, I was so fortunate that my tutors, I was helping a lot of students in first year. And in my second year, my tutor came to me and said, hey, we saw you teaching students in computer classes for like, you're, you're helping out and you're pretty good. Why don't you teach computer class and you can earn more money? You don't have to be a waitress because it's, it's, it's a lot more you know, relevant to what you learn. And so I started to be a, a teaching assistant in second year. And in the meantime, I, I started to knock on the doors of the Aquarian, Sydney Aquarian and the Australian Museum and started to licensing the work I did in the first year. And I had all these masks that I made inspired by the aquarium animals. So I literally, I walked down to the aquarium and like, hey, I got these designs. Would you like to uh, license them? And they said, you're in luck. We're in 25th anniversary. And we actually was looking for designer, looking for work. So I got my first big paycheck that helped to subsidize my tuition cost and also my, um, my, my school cost. And I just, I'm so grateful. And I was, I was living in UTS housing as well. And the housing people also asked me to design brochures and, you know, bus tools. So I started to kind of learn the business skill and the people skill along the way when I'm learning my design degree. And so that is something I think, again, things are changing all the time. There's limitations, but how you can work within the limitation, that's where the creativity comes from. And that's where the innovation comes from. And creativity is so abundant. Sometimes you need a box. People say, think out of the box, but you actually need the box. You need the limitation so that it will really truly let you see how creative you can be. Thanks. Back to you, Thanks, Yi Ying. So Here. the medium will change. You can't control that, but you can control how you pivot. And it sounds to me that you pivoted multiple times and took advantage of all the opportunities you had. So that's another important lesson today as well. Um, Peggy, I'll go to you next. I'm an economist. And one of the things economists talk about all the time is innovation. And I'm also conscious that in China, uh, one of President Xi Jinping's signature initiatives is this concept of innovation led development. Now, when I look at your CV, yes, today you are with a high end jewellery producer, but it's interesting because I go back and look at other companies you've worked for and they're all very different. For example, you've worked for a Korean fashion brand, J Style. You've worked for a beauty giant, Olay, we all know them. Uh, a luxury automotive company that is Jaguar Land Rover. So I want to talk about innovation with you. And 
in particular, when you reflect back on your experience in these different organisations, different industries, very different market environments, I imagine, um, were there commonalities there in terms of the some, some of the key innovations that you witnessed in each of those companies? Can you hear your thoughts? Um, sure. I will use Procter Gamble's brand Olay as an excellent example show how to use digital media toward youth marketing. Um, for three years, I worked the Olay account at a leading global agency. In 2015, when I came to Olay, the brand was very oldish. Young people regarded it as a mommy beauty brand, not young beauty brand. After 2012, social media became more and more important and e-commerce became the number one most important sales channel in China. Uh, every brand was trying to adapt to uh, digital marketing. Uh, what we did in those three years to win in digital marketing, first, we shifted the media model from traditional push media to pull media by using as a spokesperson um, the online influencers and the superstar that the young people loved, or we manage the media and use um, influencers and celebrities in different tiers to d deliver different stories to different audience. And to communicate with the young people, we also use the media platforms that they use every day. For example, the Little Red Book, Weibo, TikTok, all of those platforms are really important to online sales can drive big traffic to electronic commerce and can directly affect the purchase decision. Um, for example, consumers will first find some hot superstars endorsement for Olay on Weibo. Then they search for specific skincare solutions based on their skin, uh, skincare needs on the Red Book, where they will find a main, many influencers endorsements for Olay. In this way, we seeded the product purchase decision in their hearts and minds. We try to fully influence their decision every day, everywhere. Um, we also use um, the trending internet language rather than boring press release to tell the brand and product stories. Um, and we created, created beauty, beautiful and interesting communication visuals and videos exactly suitable to um, each media platform. Before we create the, the stories, we took the time to uh, gain consumers' insights to try to understand their emotional appeals rather than only their skin appeals. All of the campaigns delivered pos positive emotional stories and a solution to their uh, emotional appeals. All the things we did in those three years made Olay win the market again, especially the Generation Z market, and it draw, draw very, very big organic buzz to, and talkability on the internet. We call it our seeding project. It's interesting, isn't it, Peggy, because for you, the change wasn't something you ran away from. In fact, that was not, not reacting to that change was the problem at the start. And what you came along is you recognised the change and took advantage of it. And that's the source of your success. Um, so I think that's another important um, message to come out of today. Yes, change is can be scary. Uh, it certainly brings challenges. No one's saying it's not, um, but recognising it and pivoting, like Yi Ying said, to take advantage of those opportunities um, really is central to success in today's, um, today's highly changeable environment. Alex, let's go to you next. Alex, one of the scariest, well, strikes me as being pretty scary anyway, statistics <laughs> I often read about is that in 20 years' time, a lot of the jobs that around today simply won't exist. Now that's going to create some anxiety for a lot of people. And I think that's un understandable. I guess that what that does emphasize though is the importance of transferable skills. That is skills that you can take from one career or one firm to a different one. Um, when you look into the crystal ball of the next 20 years, uh, recognizing that some of the jobs that exist now won't exist in 20 years time, um, what do you see as being those transferable skills that will really be the key to success, no matter what the world looks like in 20 years time? Thanks, James. Uh, I think that's a really, really good question you've just raised. Now, uh, I've recently read a book called The, uh, the AI Future by Mr. Lee Kai-Fu. 
the former president of Google China, and now uh, one of the uh, I guess best best known entrepreneurs and investors in China. Uh, I think he believes in today's fast technology developing environment, where we often hear and see uh, AI, big data, deep learning, 5G, and all of those are evolving at much much faster pace than ever. Uh, what I mean is that the machines can potentially provide better and more cost-effective solutions in many real-life scenarios. Now, as a result of that, uh, if, if, as you have just mentioned, many jobs could, could potentially go extinct. This would also extend to, say, professions like accountants, uh, tax advisors like myself, uh, bankers, and even doctors like radiologists, uh, which I think is already happening today. Uh, therefore, uh, I think it would be imperative for us to, uh, to prepare, prepare ourselves well in advance in order to stay competitive now and in the future. And certainly in my own instance, uh, long-term employability is uh, one of my KPIs that I've been trying to, uh, to, you know, to, to work in order to uh, sustain. Uh, back to the question in terms of the transferable skills, uh, I think here are some of the skills that could be uh, relevant in keeping myself competitive and employable uh, in the long term. Uh, first of all, I think networking skills. Now, speaking of my own experience, uh, networking has certainly helped me quite a bit in terms of developing my career over the years. Uh, as you become good at networking, I think you'll get to see more opportunities and doors opening up to you. Uh, and as a UTS graduate myself, I'm part of the, uh, the UTS uh, Shanghai Alumni Network, uh, which I will tell you a little more uh, later in today's webinar. Uh, I guess the other sets of skills would be uh, cultural awareness and uh, communication skills, as Ying and Peggy mentioned earlier. Now, I'm sure most, most audience today are bilingual, even multilingual, and perhaps have uh, cross-culture uh, experiences. Uh, what I have experienced in my career is that uh, you would appreciate and perhaps be appreciated a lot better if you listen to and develop a strong, I guess, interest in your counterparts, in your dealings with them. Uh, other than the, I guess, uh, leadership skills. Now, I, I trust our guests today, Ian, Peggy, and James yourself, are all very successful in your roles and certainly, uh, I guess, great leaders. Uh, in my own instance, it has been a very long and tough journey uh, for me to become a, uh, perhaps an amateur leader in my business today. Uh, therefore, I guess I still have a long way to go to become even, a, I guess, a better leader. Uh, in, my, in my opinion, a leader will, will be a lot more uh, in substance and uh, details than what you may actually sound. Everyone may have a different philosophy in terms of, uh, you know, being a leader, uh, which is totally fine. Uh, but I guess what really matters is that uh, you are capable of leading, leading the team, leading the folks, to achieve your common goals, be it business or community work or even a university group assignment for the matter. So I guess here are my two cents. Back to James. Thanks, Alex. Look, you mentioned a number of transferable skills there. You said networking, cultural awareness, um, interest in others, leadership skills. But something you said first actually really caught my attention as well. You said that for you personally, your long-term employability was a KPI, a key performance indicator. And for you, that meant that preparation was also at the heart of your success. So despite these waves of change that are washing over us, um, we're not defenseless, we're not helpless, and um, being prepared is a core part of responding to that challenge. Thanks, Alex. Look, I've got a, I've got a couple more of my own questions here, uh, but I've got a question that's come in from an audience member. Um, Ying and Peggy, I might put this to you. Are you able to give us a, a short, sharp answer to this one? 
The question is, how would somebody recognise and pivot on a wave of change? So we know the changes are coming all the time. Are there any secrets to recognising what the key changes are and in which direction we should pivot? Ying, I might start with you. I would like to let Peggy speak first because I've been always speaking first. So um, courtesy, Peggy, you should go first. Oh, uh, okay. I, I, I think it, um, the most important is learn, it, it, it's learning. It's like, um, um, it, it's like learning skills. So mm. you will be, sorry, you can find some new, 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 new things. So from you learning something new, I guess you can see the different, different part of, um, the, um, opportunities. I myself right. may, um, I'm still learning every day. I'm learning the different operation skills and data system of various media platforms, especially the new and potential, uh, potential platforms such as TikTok and live streaming. Mm. Um, so um, content is always king, but the platforms are constantly changed. We must uh, keep generating the content and keep adapting to the new media platforms, keep trying to talk with young audience and keep learning from them. Yeah. Th thanks, Peggy. So that's interesting because your ability to recognize the wave of change and pivot was based on the fact that you'd done the preparation that Alex talked about before. Um, you knew exactly what was going on in today's media environment and today's communications environment in a way that some of your predecessors at Ole perhaps didn't. And that's what was their doom and your success. So Ying, do you have anything to add on that? Yes, I do. Um, I would like to actually add it in a more sort of linguistic perspective because I am a huge fan of languages and uh, I think a lot of us here are bilingual or probably multilingual here. And if you speak Chinese, you might know the actual Chinese character of change is, um, well, change in Chinese uh, is um, it sometimes change or challenges. Actually, challenge, that's a better way. Challenge uh, in Chinese is quinnan, right? So quin means trapped. Nan is like hard. So you're trapped in a hardship and you, can't, you have nowhere to go. But the, the opposite of the word kunan or challenge is rong yi, right? Easy. Everybody, every time when change, like things, we want change to be easy. We just want it to be easy. And how can we make it easy for us? It's literally, if you look at the word rong, means allow, right? Rong xu, rong na, like it's a container. It allows. And yi is, we know yi jing, ai qing or yi jing. It's the book of change. Right? So rong yi is literally means allow change. Think about it. So the way for you to pivot, the way for you to come out of the trap is allow change. When change come, you don't resist it, you allow it. So that's kind of coming from a linguistic perspective. How do you recognize it? It's hard. And how do you overcome it? Allow change, embrace it. Ying, what an advantage it is to have Chinese as your mother tongue. I mean, I was just a bit I jealous know, right? listening to you there. <laughs> um, to have a language that allows you to think in those creative ways in a way, unfortunately, I'm sorry to say as a native English speaker, I don't think English allows or prompts you to do. So I think, you know, P Peggy's comment, um, that we need to be across the detail of what's happening today. And then Yi Ying's comment that we need to recognize the difficulties, but be open to the change. Um, I think put those two answers together and you get a really fabulous response to the question, um, which was, how do we recognize the changes that are washing over us? And then how do we, and what direction do we pivot? All right, Alex. I want to bring you back into the conversation now. I've got another question here that I, I wanted to go through. Before, you talked about the uh, soft skills that you think, looking into your crystal ball in the next 20 years, that will become vital um, to professional success. Can we get even more detail than that um, and talk about what type of roles 
you see? You know, when people are sitting now in 2020, whether it's in Beijing or in Shanghai or Beijing or, or Xi'an or wherever else, what type of roles might people be able to think of that can inspire them to get from where they are now to where they probably will be or where, or where they might want to be in 20 years' time? Thanks, James. So again, a really good and intriguing question. Now, I've seen, uh, I've seen some reports suggesting some fancy jobs like data detective, uh, personal data broker, uh, even uh, so-called uh, personal memory curator. Now, I can't ascertain whether those will come, come real or not. Uh, having said that, without going into any specific, I guess, industries or jobs, I believe the type of roles that may emerge in the future uh, in face of the fast developing technologies uh, may be those of more human interaction oriented and innovation driven. Now, so in this regard, I guess uh, one skill set that I would like to point out is uh, innovative thinking. Now, speaking from my own experience, if I may, um, being a professional, I guess, accountant and tech, tech advisor myself, uh, as you would appreciate, we strictly follow the written rules and refrain ourselves from being innovative to some extent. Now, as the world is fast emerging, I've come to realize that I've really got to think outside of my space, outside of my, I guess, my uh, expertise, trying to be creative and trying to be able to you know find connections uh, weak or strong across different subjects and matters and really trying to achieve the effect of one plus one being greater than two so i guess you know here, here are my two cents back to james Thanks, Alex. Uh, gee, you three are an inspiring bunch today. I'm, I'm having a great time moderating this panel because I think we're getting to some really core issues that are going to underpin success, um, no matter what the world looks like in 20 years time. Look, again, I've got a couple more questions of my own, but I think I, I, might, um, I might go to our audience again. And this is a great question. This is coming from Andy. Look, let me throw it to the panel and um, whoever likes, would like to um, can have a go at responding it, to it. Andy asks, how did you expand your possibility of getting experience and in terms of creating a new business? Um, I remember you said you showed up at the aquarium with, a, with an innovative solution, an entrepreneurial solution. Um, so how do you expand those possibilities of getting experience in creating a new business? Um, Andy says, I'm wondering about the experience in the middle of studying or after graduation. And look, that's a good question, isn't it? Because we often think about experience as something, you know, we do after we graduate. But Andy's, yeah. I think Andy's got it right. And he said, look, what can we do in the middle of studying? Um, how do we expand those possibilities in the middle of studying? Look, I'll just throw that to the panel. Um, Ying, maybe you want to start it off, us off or feel free to defer to another panelist as well. Sure, sure. Thank you, James. I'm happy to start to answer this question uh, simply because I started my entrepreneurial experience when I was in second year. And um, I think that right now is seemingly it's a very challenging and very difficult time for us to you know graduate find a job or graduate start a business and i actually think it's the most amazing time for students especially students still study to start a business or start the actual um real life professional experience during the time you're studying I'll give, I'll give myself as the best example because that's my experience. I actually know it inside out. I started to teach in second year as a uh, teaching assistant. And also I started to actually lecturing by the end of the study, uh, I became a lecturer afterwards. But in the meantime, when I was doing computer, uh, teaching computing, teaching typography, I was also um, taking a lot of volunteer jobs. I was also helping out a lot of international students um, and those experiences actually lead me to places that I would never imagine. I was actually able to 
get a advertising agency job right after um, I finished my exchange study in London because I simply reached out. I reached out to some of the best advertising agency in Shanghai because I was having a summer break and I just sent them my portfolio, which is a website and everything is digital these days. I mean, back in 10 years ago, it's already digital. Um, I was putting my work out there before I graduated. I started to upload my work um, when I was in third year and I started to have client works. So by the end of my graduation, I already had three years of experiences in the belt. In the meantime, I have inbound projects that's enough to pay me for an entire year, even before I was getting my graduation ceremony. So I, that's how I started my studio. I did not like go for a full-time job. I was working within like the capacity that I have, but in the meantime, I was helping so many people. And because I was doing so many work that I love, people see through the work. And I got so many referrals from my UTS housing design, that brochure that I designed. They were still printing the brochure. Like two years after I graduated, I went back to visit. They were still printing the brochure. And that brochure has my name and web address on it. And it actually brings me a lot more projects. Even though I started as a volunteer project but later on it really pays off so i think it is really important to do something you truly care about it's something that you're really really passionate because people can see from the work you do you're having fun but also you're putting so much love and energy it will shine through and that's how you get clients i get most of my clients from us i'm still in the us right now um and like a lot, 80% of my clients actually, after I graduated, were based in US and Europe, and they find me from the internet. And so that is my, my, um, my uh, advice, but it's also my urge for you to really reach out to people, put your work out there, do volunteer work that you love. And in the same time, when you get enough experience, starting to charge people because your time and your effort and your education, you put a lot, your parents and yourself put a lot of energy into it. You should start it to also ask, you know, give, 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 but also ask when you're ready. Um, so that's my two cents. Thanks, Yi Ying. I'm loving the energy that I'm getting from you through this webinar today. Peggy, um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I would like to ask you a question that kind of follows on a bit from Ian talked about what she did during her study. Now, I think one of the things that really stands out to me about your CV and your success is the number of major companies that you've worked for. And so in terms of uh, taking advantage of opportunities after graduation, how did you go from one major company to another and be successful at each? Um, I think um, because you can, um, you you take the really, uh, you take enough time to work harder and find new opportunities and keep learning in different companies, um, especially in online experience. Um, I learned everything and every uh, everything about uh, integrated communication market marketing. So, uh, which make me stronger and stronger. So then I find another job uh, because I ha already have like enough skills. But uh, like I said before, um, I really appreciate the UDS um, professional education. So um, uh, uh, almost gave me uh, uh, like everything. Um, I need in my daily work. So this is why a professional skills and keep learning and keep my communication um, skills. So this is why and from the one company to another company because you are stronger and, and stronger. So this is why you can find a new and great opportunities later. Thanks, Peggy. Look, I'm sorry to say we are getting closer to the end of today's webinar. I could certainly go on for a lot longer, uh, but I do just want to make sure I say thank you to Yi Ying, Alex and Peggy. I've personally learned a lot and I wanted to thank the three of you for really giving back to the UTS community 
because the people tuning in to listen to us today are people like you were not so long ago. Um, and so I think it's really inspiring that in that current situation they find themselves in, um, they can look at the three of you and be inspired and imagine um, their career success in the coming years. Alex, um, before we go, can you let our audience know a bit about how to connect with the China Alumni Network of UTS? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we actually have a, a number of, as a matter of fact, alumni, UTS alumni networks uh, in, in China. Uh, at the moment, we have one alumni network in Shanghai and the other one in Beijing. And I believe uh, in the near future, we perhaps have another one down the house in, in Canton. Uh, and I've been part of the, uh, the Shanghai Alumni Network since 2018. And we run our quarterly alumni events for our UTS alumni here in China. And the last one we had was in uh, September, and that was a barbecue party. And the next, the next one will be our Christmas party uh, in December, I believe. Uh, to join the alumni network, all you've got to do is to scan the QR code as you can see on your screen. And uh, you know, one of our folks will be in touch with you very shortly. So uh, feel free to sign up and we look forward to having all of you at our events. Thank you, James. Thanks very much, Alex. Okay, we'll wrap it up now. So I'd like to thank Yiying, Alex and Peggy once again. Look, today it was Yiying, Alex and Peggy, uh, but in five years time, we might be doing a webinar like this with some of our audience today. So most importantly, thank you to our audience for joining us. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again at our next virtual UTS event. Thank you.